right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming. So this presentation is a, a kind of a, a condensed version, 20 minutes version of the course that I teach whole quarter. So uh, bear with me. We'll try to go really quick through it. So the question why now is something that every entrepreneur faces when they decide what to do with a particular technology. And I want to start with a quote from uh, Charles Dickens. And it says, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. So the time, typically, the way we think about time, it could be really good for something, it could be really bad for something. And how you make your choices, how you pick the area where you try to innovate, really matters, really defines your success. For example, you know, see the, the chart Bitcoin, right? So at a certain point, it was really good to invest in Bitcoin, right? It would be really beneficial. It was really a good time to be in Bitcoin. And no matter what technology, no matter you know, how, how good somebody was back in 2014, you would make a lot of money. Now, if you wanted to develop a great technology for newspaper publishing, right? No matter how good your technology was, you know, no matter how good your, you know, let's say, color selection and the quality of print, you would not succeed. The timing would be really bad. And, you know, speaking of masters and robots, you know, look at the rob robotics. So we can see that the time seems to be good for, uh, for industrial robots, at least for industrial robots. So the question becomes, you know, how do you predict timing? And the interesting aspect of it, and, and it's kind of when you think about timing as an innovator, you always think about timing, you kind of, there's the bad news. The bad news is that it's not an easy task. And a lot of really smart people think that predicting innovation timing is practically impossible. And, you know, there's a, if you're familiar with the efficient market hypothesis, that, you know, all information is already there. You know, you cannot really beat anybody. And also, typically, when you see uh, presentations about innovation, especially in the media, they talk about serendipity, that innovation comes from nowhere, right? For example, you know, Edison's light bulb. You see Edison and, you know, we see his light bulb. And you're probably all familiar with the sign of, you know, the light bulb goes in your head. In reality, this moment, light bulb moment, never happened. It was invented for the video, for, for the movie that they shot about Edison. In reality, he worked on it for two years, nonstop, trying different things. So thinking, when you think about innovation timing, when you, when you decide when and how you're going to proceed with your idea, you really have to think about it more pragmatically and pay attention to what really goes on in the industry. So I took this uh, screenshot from uh, a Sequoia Capital uh, venture, uh, venture Group uh, web page. And this is this three questions that I typically ask aspiring entrepreneurs. The first one is, what's the problem? What are you trying to solve? The second is, what's your solution? And the third question is the impossible question. Why now? Why do you think your idea has a better chance to succeed now versus, you know, let's say yesterday or the day after tomorrow? And we have to deal with this question. If we deal with it pragmatically, we actually can accomplish the impossible. And that's the example of Sequoia Capital. And I start with Don Valentine, its founder. And you can see this is kind of the pattern of Silicon Valley where he started as a sales engineer in the very beginning, at the very beginning of, 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 of uh, you know, Fairchild Semiconductors, the first firm that created Silicon Valley. And then you see his track record. Then he started kind of his own company, the restructured existing company. So from being an engineer, starting essentially a new company, restructuring company, and then starting a venture fund, right? And you see the success, the ability to ask yourself difficult questions. Why now? It's a really difficult question because sometimes people say, oh, I have the technology. Or maybe there's a market. But you have to be really tough on yourself and say, why now? And you see the success of the company is they funded, you know, who is who in, in, high, in high technology today. And that aspect of it, all the technology is really difficult to predict. So like when here you talk to people in Poland, people really excited. And you know, another interesting thing that this is a slide, and you probably would not recognize it. This is how Silicon Valley looked 60 years ago. This used to be a 
solely agricultural uh, region where people mostly grew fruits and vegetables. You know, uh, pears and, and apples and, 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 you know, peaches. And that's how Silicon Valley looked like. So it's really hard to predict the success. And what we really need to do, we need to understand why is it difficult to predict the success of a particular technology and why is it difficult to predict timing. So uh, being here in Poland, you're probably familiar with this person, right? Nicolas Copernicus. So the idea is after him we understand the way we measure time, right? The way we measure time, a year is a cycle of how the Earth rotates around the sun, right? And the day is a cycle how the Earth rotates around its own axis. This cycle, that's how we measure calendar time, has nothing to do with innovation. There's no connection between the calendar and innovation, how you come up with ideas, how you come up with new breakthroughs. And that's the fundamental problem. If you try to connect those two, you are highly likely to fail. And that's why people try to predict innovation by calendar. They're bound to fail. That's why they fail all the time. So when you think about innovation, we have to think about it completely differently. In general, when you think about time, it's not we take it for granted, but it's actually a very difficult concept. If, when people do you know, cognitive studies, they know that children recognize, start recognizing timing by the age of 10. It's one of the last concepts that they recognize you know, when they start understanding math, even after language. And even in our everyday life, when you think about time, we use time in all kinds of different things. For example, in this picture, we can see that you know, there's calendar time, right? And there's a clock time. The two different things, and if you think about the year doesn't co coincide with, with week calendar. There are all kinds of discrepancies between timing. So that's why when you think about innovation timing, not only we don't understand innovation well, we actually don't understand time. We just really don't. And if you think what happens in our brain when people think in time, there are multiple cognitive processes that happen in your brain. So you cannot just say, come in and say, oh, you know, something is going to happen you know, today or tomorrow or the year from now. So when you, see those, when you hear those forecasts, pretty much you don't just believe them. Because again, predicting something by calendar time is completely meaningless. So how do we do that? Uh, so when you look at it, one of the most interesting aspects of innovation is so-called excuse me, uh, Cinderella stories. And you see in those pictures, you know, you probably recognize all these people, right? You know, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, Larry Page, and, and all others. They all Cinderella stories. You know, if you think about it, most of them were college drop dropouts. They didn't complete college. Uh, Larry Ellison, who, is, who used to be the chair of Oracle Corporation, you know, number two person in the world, he dropped out of college twice. Steve Jobs never completed college. You know, Mark Zuckerberg dropped out of college. So the Cinderella story is typically something that says, okay, something comes out of nothing, right? Like Silicon Valley is a Cinderella story. There's like agricultural reason, uh, region, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's a, you know, cap, you know people think about as an innovation capital of the world. <clears throat> and we typically think about as, you know, geniuses, but if you look into Google, for example, Larry Page, Back in, uh, in the late 90s, he tried to sell his company, his algorithm, to another company for $1.6 million, right? And they didn't buy. And that's how Google became its own company, because he wanted to make a business in himself. So that's, that's a typical Cinderella story. Uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the, the chairman of Facebook, he tried to sell his company to MySpace for $30 million they refuse to buy, okay? So you have those stories, again, you know, people make mistakes all the time, but that's the, the essence of a Cinderella story. You know, you come from out of nothing, and you succeed where people don't expect. I want to show you another uh, example of a Cinderella story, and all of you are familiar with Apple, and everybody, you know, pretty much thinks that Steve Jobs is a genius, which he is, but I also want to show you how Apple is another, you know, Silicon Valley Cinderella story. This is a chart that shows the market share that Macintosh, the main product of Apple, had throughout pretty much 90s. You can see this red sliver over there, probably like 4% of the market. 
right, compared to Windows. So if somebody said that, well, by 2010, Apple is going to be you know, one of the most valuable co uh, companies in the world, people would laugh in your face. So, and this is uh, from Newsweek in 1996, right? So basically, Apple is considered a complete failure. Steve Jobs come back, and he says, well, the company is completely bankrupt, right? You don't have the money, you don't have anything, and uh, what, the way they survived, they basically got money from Microsoft. So, you know, here's the story. You know, you're bankrupt, the company is, is gone, right? So what do you do? And this is from his interview with uh, Professor Rummel, the one that uh, specializes in um, uh, corporate strategy, say, what are you going to do? I'll let you read, but the basic thing is that I'm going to wait for the next big thing. Did he really wait for the next big thing? Do you just sit there and wait? Of course not. What you do, you try to come up with the next idea and see what's happening in the world and how your potential in your Cinderella ha story happens. So when you analyze those innovation stories that come from nowhere, and I want to use the, the, the kind of the, the, the Cinderella story analysis and show you, probably all familiar, that's, that's the wonderful thing about you know, fairy tales, that Cinderella stories are all over the place. All cultures have this, this structure. You go to Asia, you go to you know, Europe, you go to even Africa, they have you know, similar things. So I want to think about you know, a Cinderella story. And typically when people consider it, they tend to focus on the Cinderella herself, right? That's a you know, beautiful girl you know, that's been neglected and you know, all of a sudden she becomes you know, the queen. So what we, don't, what we don't pay attention to is the backdrop. Because what happens is, let's say, in Silicon Valley, the interesting thing about Silicon Valley, those technology Cinderella stories keep happening. It's not just one Cinderella. Silicon Valley keeps producing technology Cinderellas. And, I, and any interesting region, if you look into region that succeeded with innovation, the Cinderellas keep appearing. So when you look back behind the screen and start thinking about what's behind the Cinderella story from a timing perspective, and one thing that's really simple, if you don't have a prince, you're not going to have a Cinderella. Fundamentally, right? You could be the most beautiful girl in the world. You, have the, you could have the, the, the best technology out there. No prince, no Cinderella. So that's a fundamental. So from a timing perspective, not the calendar time, and not how old you know, somebody is, it's where's the prince. So the prince is essentially the market opportunity, the opportunity to create something new, the new world that's emerging. Another important aspect of it is there's no ball, there's no Cinderella. See? Very simple. If there's no prince, no, Cinderella, no, no ball, there'll be no Cinderella. And that's the interesting thing about Silicon Valley, that if you have a prince and if you have a ball, you're guaranteed to have a Cinderella. You don't know who the Cinderella is going to be, but there will be one, at least one. And that's the, the, the interesting thing about innovation timing, for example, in Silicon Valley and other advanced you know, technology regions, is that there's a, people look for the next new prince, and people what? There's a non-stop ball, there's non-stop communication. So, for example, today's event is an element of this potentially a ball where inventors and entrepreneurs and VCs and all kinds of other people get together and they select and they find what's going to happen. Another aspect of it, you know, you think about uh, what's the business model, right? Kind of what's the business model behind the Cinderella story? So you think about, you know, fairy godmother. Do you know what, who fairy godmother is? It's the, this, this woman that gives the Cinderella the dress and, the, and, and this, you know, beautiful... Uh, no, uh, what is it, the coach. multiple horses and everything? A coach. A coach, right. So what's the business model? Because, you know, uh, the fairy godmother, does, 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 does he tell the Cinderella that, okay, go and get ma and, and marry, you know, the guy from the next village? No. What's the business model? Go get the prince, right? And if you don't get the prince, everything turns into a pumpkin by midnight. 
<laughs> so that's, that's the notion. Again, I'm using this, this parable, but to understand that innovation timing is very critical. Again, it has nothing to do with calendar time. It has to do with the confluence of events and understanding what are the major implications of the technology and business today. So if you're an entrepreneur, if you're thinking about innovation timing, it's very simple. You, want, you, know, you need to answer those three questions. Is there a prince? Because if there's no prince, you know, there's, no, there's no success. Is there a, you know, where's the ball? If you don't know where the ball is, you know, sorry, you're just like, again, you, you can be the most beautiful you know, technologist or, or, or Cinderella in the world, nothing happens. And how long until the midnight? Because if you miss the deadline, if the opportunity window is gone, right? Your technology, your business, everything is going to be gone. So this kind of reminds you all the time when you think about innovation timing, it's actually very interesting. It's very interesting because it's not trivial. You need to think about it completely differently, not in terms of calendar time, because again, there's no relationship, there's no, in, there's no intrinsic relationship between how Earth rotates and how innovation happens. So uh, the good news for entrepreneurs, and I, I use this quote, and I let you, uh, let, let you read it. So the new generation of entrepreneurs always come from new ideas. You know, new ideas come and new technology, you see the Cinderella stories and technology stories, they come in and they completely change the world. So the new generation, when I look at my students, I always love it that they come up with better ideas than I have. And that's really interesting. So you hear, you probably come up with better ideas than the previous generation. And the question is, you know, how and why you would do it. And it, it, it's, it's important to understand what are the events, the major events that shape today. One of such events, and, and like revolutions. For example, today we live in a services revolution. What Henry Ford did for products 100 years ago Google and we talked about other companies they did for services. Now we live in a world of mass services. It's a mass services revolution. Another revolution that we live in is what? Deep learning, right? Deep learning revolution. Another revolution is health and medical services, you know, genetics, you know, editing genome. That's another revolution that we live in. We live in a, in a revolution that is relates to logistics and robotics. So as the new generation of innovators come in, they all have this chance. But the point is you need to understand, you know, where's the, where's the, when, when is the midnight? If you don't take the chance, right, so that's one of the, one of the reasons we're here is, we need to take our chances, because if you miss your chances, it's really difficult to wait, and it's all, sometimes it's impossible to wait until the next opportunity comes. So I want to finish with, uh, with an old quote from 2000, ago, from 2000 years ago. Faith leads the willing and drags the unwilling. So there are plenty of opportunities out there, and it's our task as innovators, and I hope this conference will help you decide that, to discover those windows of opportunities and to answer the difficult questions, and you can answer this question for yourself. Why now? What should I be doing now to become a successful innovator for the next, you know, whatever, 20 years? so that your Cinderella story will be all over the world and people will be teaching courses about you. So I wish you a lot of luck, and I wish you that your innovation timing will be extremely perfect and you'll succeed in whatever you're trying to do. And I hope this conference will really help you understand what you can accomplish in this really interesting and new, uh, new brain world. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you for this wonderful speech. All right, thank you. Comforting speech as a college dropout. Thank you. I have a future, sir. Uh, it's all about being creative. Uh, thanks again.